there will always be resistance. The next battle will always be near. As long as you have everything, there will be those who have nothing to fear. Our future is not yours to choose. Welcome to Voices of Resistance. You are listening to WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community radio with Global Soul. The viewpoints expressed in the following program are not necessarily those of WRUU, its license holder, or the staff. I'm Barbara Humphrey. And I'm Albert Strickland. Co-hosts of today's show. Voices of Resistance is a project of the Savannah Justice and Peace Collective. We give voice to resistors who have no voice in mainstream media and present a wide range of issues that affect us all. But there will always be resistance. The next battle will always be near. As long as you Everything. There will be those who have nothing to fear And little by little, or maybe all at once you will lose Because our future is not yours to choose So welcome to Voices of Resistance Today we'll be talking about Black August, and we have with us Sada as our guest. So welcome, Sada. And um, we'd like to start by reading you the opening paragraph, an article entitled Black August for Black Survival that appeared on a website called BOSSIP and was posted August, August 9, 2016. What if black folks in America decided they were going to chuck the deuces and take a month off from white folks. What if we took a month outside of February to study and learn about our history? What if we decided we wanted to pour libations for the many lives that have been lost and that keep being taken as we continue to fight for the right to simply live and be black at this time in America? The article goes on to state, that Black August is not Black History Month, and that's uh, a very important part of distinction. It is not a time to celebrate the accomplishment of the only blacks to have made the pages of America's history books, um, or sub to uh, like MLK, Harriet Tubman, or Frederick Douglass. It is not a time for celebrating black history. It is a time, though, to reflect on black history and to use it to create solutions. It is a time to focus specifically on all black people in history who refuse to be enslaved or unjustly imprisoned or have lost their lives in the struggle, especially those who were birthed or died in August and those who refused and struggled against an, an great injustices. We feel it's also a time not only to focus on the resistors of yesterday and create solutions, but to learn how to effectively resist today. Sada, a local activist who was driven to stand up when she saw the local abject poverty while walking children to school each morning and home in the afternoon, joins us. Sada, would you like to grab the microphone and um, add to that introduction? Say hi to everybody. Good evening. My name is Sada Fowles, um, and I am a resident of Can Park in Savannah, Georgia. And... We decided through our neighborhood association about two and a half years ago, there was a rapist who was attacking young girls. So we decided to volunteer and sit out there until the last, child, the last school bell rang to get in there. And through that, we developed a walking school bus for elementary school children. And one of the things that happened while doing this walking school bus is that I got to meet, even though I had my family had been in that neighborhood for better than 50 years, I got to meet the young parents living in that neighborhood. And I discovered, contrary to popular opinion, that they weren't lazy, <laughs> that they were working, but they weren't making enough to survive. 
So I decided to start researching some of it. And most of them, unfortunately, work in the service or tourism industry in Savannah. And it does not pay them a survival wage. Of course not. And you've shown us recently what some of those wages are, what the amount to household income in the areas like Can Park, Kyla Brownsville, and those. And it, it, it's, it's, almost, it's criminal, actually, that uh, people to work so hard, sometimes two jobs, and just barely, barely survive when there are a lot of fat cats in this city who are making millions while off the backs of people again. So Absolutely. And as we get into Black August and look for solutions to so many of our problems, um, that's what we're hoping. Please listen. You're going to be hearing about people who stood up to this kind of oppressive society that we've just been talking about, and um, we all need to think about those resistors and how we can use that for today. Actually, w we need to be thinking about what we can do to emulate those people who stood up. Those uh, Most of us in this room remember the 70s, at least, if not the 60s. Sauter is the youngest <laughs> one here. <laughs> and so we remember these people that were standing up, remember what happened to them as well. But we have to have that courage today, and uh, we have to put all the, 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 the nonsense aside and really start working to find solutions, which is basically what this month is supposed to be, a time to learn, reflect, and create solutions when you see these problems. Sauda said some. We've got gentrification coming up. We were just talking about that before we came into the uh, studio here, uh, about how the east side and uh, the west side are just being pushed out, pushed out to the south side. Where do we go from there? Right. So, so why August? To understand Black August, we need to get to the backstory that led to the start. Black August is a time, as we said, to learn, reflect, and create solutions. And we'd like to spend our time on this show telling stories about the people, places, and events that you very likely have never heard about. Not everything will have happened in August. Not every important story will be told. But if we are to achieve our goal, the right to simply live black and brown and every other you, we need to start somewhere. Why not today, August 16th, 2017? We, um put together the show. It has been a, a lot of research on this show for us. We've learned a lot of things. We've confronted a lot of issues in our own communities, our own lives, our own families even, and uh, to, to see why we are here now. But what we really need is a vision of what to do now and uh, what is to be done. We've, um, uh, I, I didn't know where to go sometimes with this because the, the things from the 70s and the 60s that seem to be pointing the solutions, I am of the opinion, after reading what I've been reading for the last six years almost, is that we need to start re-emulating or emulating some of those tactics and some of the things they had. We've learned a lot about some of the things they did in the past uh, three or four days, a greater in-depth. We knew the, the outside, but we've looked deeper inside to see what they did, the depth of what they did, and those things can be recreated. We can do them now if we've got people strong enough that want to stand up and see it done. And the question is, do we have that? Right. And also, first, the first most important step is to learn who these people were and what they did. And then to either emulate them or at least have their, cover their courage, their bravery. And to understand the backstory that led to the start of Black August, the brothers George and Jonathan Jackson and the Black Panther Party. Now, we just got this because we watched a movie, um, and it was called Black August, of course. And it is an in-depth study, basically, a, doc, a what would you call it, historical documentary. Uh, I call it a documentary, a movie about George Jackson and the travails and the things they went through. Now, here in Savannah, I, we didn't, in, didn't have a lot of the, the uh, I can't say problems because we had more problems, but the solutions that they chose... Uh, I know there's some history that I don't know, which is why we need to get together and we need to start talking about things. Uh, Sauda, you were f you're from where originally? Originally, I was born and raised in New York, but Savannah, Georgia is my mother's home. She was born and raised here in a neighborhood called Frogtown, which no longer exists. What's there now? 
What's there now is a SCAD condominium with the name Frogtown on the side of the building. Wow. That's cool, isn't it? Yeah. But it was a very vibrant black neighborhood that a lot of folk came out of to go on to teach and become Mm -hmm. professionals. But it was a very vibrant, strong community, and it no longer exists. It's like it if I didn't know she was born there and raised there and other people who were there, you would never know the place ever existed. Now, that's the area that uh, I-16 ramp came through, right? I-16 ramp, condominium. There's an end mark there. There's yeah. uh, um, all of that. Parker's. Air. Coin Street, Cohen Street. Wow. All of that. Um, West Boundary Street uh, to the canal. I mean, if I had not heard the stories of that neighborhood from my mother, I would have never known the neighborhood existed. You know, my I grew up on the east side off of President in Pennsylvania and Pine Gardens out there. And um, my mother used to come regularly into town, and we'd go to this place called Yakim and Yakim. Now, I know most people don't know what that is, but it was a department store on what was then West Broad Street. And she just felt at home there. It was where she went. And uh, there were other places there also. There was a uh, paint store of some kind. I can't remember it all. It's been a long time now. There was the paint store. There was Thrifties on MLK. Thrifties, that's it. There was Food Town. I remember. Uh, There was National Taylor, where it was the hub of where black people in Savannah shopped because they really could not shop on Broughton Street. Okay, and that's all lost to us now. And it's... If you look, there's the, the where the R- Mark Gilbert Civil Rights Museum is guaranteed insurance company, which was a black insurance company. It was the hub of black economic savannah, wow. and it has all disappeared. And the story about that that we don't know, and we'll do some more research on it, is were there any resistors at that time who fought the demolition of that very important place in Savannah. And that's an important thing because as we go on with this show, we're going to be talking about people. We're going to be talking about events that, um, you know, where people stood up to this kind of thing and whether they succeeded or not is important, but it's also important that they had the courage to stand up. When she asked if there were any resistors of this, of course, I, I was still young enough not to know too much. But uh, I was also in Vietnam or in the military and out of the state a lot, so I didn't have the connection that I did when I was growing up. And also in the 1960s, my family had moved to the South Side, which was the burgeoning place where all the white people fled. <laughs> so it was yeah. it was an interesting time anyway. But some of the programs that were used, we see now the poverty rate in Savannah is still criminal. The biggest crime in Savannah, and I say this often, is is poverty. That's it. The reason everything exists the way it is is because of poverty. And you showed us some of the statistics there while we were waiting here and the other day when we first started talking about this. Actually, it's crime. Actually, one of the things about the poverty rate um, in Camp Park, the medium income in Camp Park is 21000 The medium income in Kyler Brownsville is 20000 <laughs> D- Reading mm-hmm. another article, I was directed to the MIT livable wage calculator which has done cal- has calculated living wages for every county in the United States all you have to do is google this folks this information is out there and according to Chatham County and I'm not even talking about Can Parker this is Chatham County a single adult needs to make 11.41 an hour An adult with two children needs to make $28 an hour to survive. Like that's going to happen, right? Right. Now, that turns out to be about $47,000. Cad Park, the medium income is $20,000. Well, so so just to ask you a question now, Uh, we went through all the stuff we're going to be talking about, and this is... Uh, I, I learned a lot. Believe me, as I said earlier, you'll be learning a lot if you listen to the show. But uh, when all this started, uh, when you look around this, the city right now, 
the amount of poverty. The people that tonight will have their power turned off, their water turned off because they're not making enough to survive. Those who don't make enough to actually put quality food on the table at all. Those who don't have enough food to feed children before they go to school or clothing. I remember last year you were looking for clothes or for gloves yes. for children in the wintertime because they didn't have gloves money to buy gloves. Right, gloves and jackets and hats. Jackets. <laughs> now, in this day and age with a city this rich, all this opulence around us, as I said before, it's a crime. They should be uh, imprisoned somewhere. I don't like prisons at all. I think they all should be abolished. But I think we can find a better use of the one we have now. That's This is where they actually need to be. Part of the response that we learned about was we're going to talk about the Black Panther Party. Um, the, we were around... We were from around the then. beginning. Yeah. <laughs> we were there. <laughs> I was there. Yes, uh, that's something I do with a friend of mine all the time. I was there at that time. Uh, I didn't quite make uh, Attila the Hun of George Washington, but I did make this time. And this was an important time because I had no idea where it started. Neither. Neither of us did. I Actually, I was under a delusion. I sincerely believed it, but it began in California with Huey Newton and yep. Bobby Seale. So that's exactly we. what we thought. Oakland, California, yeah. that's exactly what we expected. But, but, Albert, what did we learn? Guess what? It was actually founded in Lowndes County, Alabama Amazing. in 1957. Nin- uh, well, 1965 is what I have on my okay, sheet. That fits. <laughs> okay, that fits. That, that fits, fits quite well. <laughs> yeah, the, the, uh, it started as the um, uh, Lowndes County Freedom Organization. Yes, the Lowndes County Freedom Organization. That's right. And they were primarily out to register people to vote, and it was started by Stokely Carmichael. Yes, and well, Lowndes I also so associated with California, not with Alabama. Absolutely. And Lowndes County, just as a little descriptor, was 80% black, yet at this time, before the Lowndes County Freedom Organization started registering voters, there was not a single black resident who was registered to vote, which was shocking to the two of us, shocking to me. And so not only were they out to register black folk, but also to put them up for and elect them, not just to put them out, just give them the right to vote and say, just vote for the same old, same old. Which is what we get all the time now, but uh, then when you think that someone is 80% of the population and not one person is allowed, I'm not talking about they didn't want to register. Right. They were threatened, they were beaten, they were hanged, they were killed, if they even attempted. In fact, we listened to uh, a talk by... um, uh, Uh, Ella Baker or Fannie Lou Hamer, one of the two, Fannie Lou Hamer. Yes, and who it was get amazing to. when she told the stories about how she yes. went to. Now, I'd like to relate that to Savannah and what happened here at the same time. And in future shows, we want to get to things like that locally. Yeah. But I want to lay the foundation for what people did with the Black Panther Party because all of us have the wrong view. Right. We're not taught the truth. No. Not at all. And the connection between the LCFO and the Black Panther Party, as most of us know and associated with Oakland, California, is that Stokely Carmichael did come to Loudoun County to help with the voter registration. And this organization used the Black Panther as its symbol. As this movement was gaining ground, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, who were the two individuals associated with the Black Panther Party in Oakland, asked for permission to use that symbol. They were granted that permission, and the newly formed Oakland-based Black Panther Party for self-defense got its start in 1966. And the um, um, the, the organization that was in Lowndes County did spread. Uh, quite a few areas. I'm right. sure it even reached as far as Georgia. I'm sure you know it's, it's reached to Oakland. And <laughs> We'd all. like to hope. We'd like to think so. <laughs> but uh, the things that they did uh, were amazing to me. We went through some of the, um, programs. the Black Panther Party. Yeah, yeah, which I didn't even realize because some of these things we need right now. We oh. need these programs desperately. I'd say uh, all of them. Yeah, they, they the first program they did was free breakfast for children that spread to 19 cities and fed more than 20,000 children. They started community health clinics. They called them the People's Free Medical Centers. They are uh, the Intercommunal Youth Institute to get children to learn to their highest potential, to strengthen their minds, and graduated their first class in 74. And here's one near and dear to my heart. Seniors Against a Fearful Environment, SAFE. 
to prevent crimes against the elderly, mostly people who are being robbed of their Social Security and um, providing them free transportation so they could get to the bank and cash their checks. Remember, this was years before di direct deposit. Now, uh, Sada wouldn't know about that. She's still too young. <laughs> She's much this, too young. Senior thing. Hardly. <laughs> I do remember. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also they had a, a free ambulance service. I didn't know that. Yeah. It was 24 hours, a free ambulance service. Uh, just the, the issues of race and poverty made it impossible many times for people in those poor areas to actually get adequate service at all, even in California. Yeah, a People's Free Food Program that not only provided food throughout the week, throughout the month, the year, to, to supplement the groceries of black, poor black and black people, but also mass distribution of food to people. Now, we have seen part of that here with the Savannah Feed the Hungry program at one time that did have the food giveaways from, uh, once a week. or uh, And still does. Still Actually, does. Yeah, our, still does. our representative or Pastor Gilliard will be doing one on, uh, is it tomorrow or Saturday, out at, uh, believe it or not, Lake Mayor. Oh. He oh, will be giving okay. away a food giveaway. That's great. The one thing that's uh, important to realize about this is this is not a racial thing. Poverty no. doesn't know no. any color, and if it had not been for this program, there were many times when I wouldn't have eaten. So it, I really appreciate the program. I understand the importance of the program, and uh, it, it really made a big difference for a lot of people. Right. I mean, in a, in a prior show, we talked about food. We talked about um, the fact that we produce enough food in this country so that nobody should go to bed hungry, but it's in the distribution where the inequality lies. And this is a way to level the playing field to there a certain extent. There was another extent. program that was very uh, interesting that I learned about. It was called the Black Student Alliance. Have you ever heard of it? No. I'm unfamiliar with them. The Black, is this all part now of, of the Black Panther Black program? Panthers. Everything we've talked about has been part of the Black Panther program. The Black Student Alliance, unified college student body with black students and the black community through programs to provide free child care services, uh, books and supplies, transportation programs, and initiation of relevant courses and better instructors. Remember, this is in the 70s. This is in the 70s. So you think about the obstacles for people going to school. And community colleges at that time were, were free especially out in California. But the obstacles, child care, um, purchasing your books, getting back and forth to school, could prevent somebody. Yeah. Transportation, yeah. Could, so here, here were these, um, these barriers being addressed so that people could get to the community uh, colleges and get to school. Now, it's, it was, it's, not a, it's not so much of a learning experience, I think, to us, because we always understood that the blank Black Panther Party was more, was not was not militant, but yet most mm. people who think about the Black Panther Party think of the militancy. That's, that's that's sometimes all they think about. But it's partially because the uh, the initial purpose of the Black Panther Party was to uh, patrol neighborhoods, yeah. to protect residents from acts of police brutality. They were armed to do that, and uh, you look at the police brutality today. It wouldn't be a bad idea in our neighborhoods <laughs> now to yes. protect ourselves from right. such violence. In fact, harassment, uh, again, is, is an interesting phenomenon that knows no color at times. Right. And, uh, but poverty is always present. It always seems. present. And um, pe poor people are t preyed on by, you know, the state. And... Um, so the other thing we learned is that 60% of the membership of the Black Panther Party was women, although... I bet you didn't know that, we did you? Yes, oh, I did. Oh, you did. I did oh, not know that. Yes, <laughs> women were extremely... As a matter of fact, in the breakfast program, yeah. the women provided security and the men made breakfast. Ooh, I oh, like God, that. I like, that, I really like yes. that. That's wonderful. But see, that's where people come together and work to solve yes. our problems. We're not depending upon... A city like Savannah to provide things for us are to the women protect us. The women actually told them, "Why should we cook the breakfast? Mm. Uh, is there something? Are you incapable?" <laughs> and the br and the brothers agreed, so That's they wonderful. cooked. That's like great. That. What a great model. We <laughs> also, you know, the other thing about the Black Panther Party that I think is really important to emphasize, and Albert said it: poverty knows no color, and. Um, 
The Black Panthers forged alliances with progressive white radicals. They were not a black-only group. They did not serve only African Americans. And um, I think that was one of the things that helped bring people together and understand their commonality. That was actually why they were targeted. After uh, Yui and Bobby Seale were in prison and Eldridge had to flee to Africa, Fred Hampton became the dominant voice of the Black Panther Party, and he had started to form alliances with Appalachian whites, uh, migrant Mexicans, and were reminding them, look, we're in this thing here together. They play for all of us to starve. That's right. (laughs) That's right. So as you listen to this description, does does it surprise you at all when you hear about everybody who's either gone to prison or been taken out one way or the other. This was a pretty powerful organization. You know, the, the one thing that, that gets me is as long as they can keep us divided, they're always on the winning yeah. side. The capitalist, they can't stand people coming to the, get the wealthy. Why are we poor in the first place? We are poor because there's too many rich people. <laughs> they're taking everything, leaving nothing for the rest of us. So 8% of the people in the world own what... Uh, 90-something percent of the, of the wealth, that leaves none of the pie for us. And we are scrabbling for scraps, which we should not have to do in this wealthy uh, world, not just here, but all over the world. But uh, if we don't come together, and you, you mentioned it with the uh, coming together of the... Uh, of uh, Appalachian yeah, White, right, the right. same, unfortunately... Where did you hear that kid before? The same group that is feeling marginalized now and is being sold Trumpism. That's it. Yep. That it is the same group. Right. And they don't realize that, as my dear deceased brother Malcolm says, you've been hoodwinked. <laughs> yep. You've been tricked. You've been bamboozled. That's right. That's right. right. You are it, as the same as the majority of whites who fought in the Civil War. You were fighting to protect the property rights of someone else. That's right. right. You didn't own slaves. No. That's right. You didn't have a big plantation anywhere. No. No. You were were struggling, and you've been hoodwinked and bamboozled. Now, this is often done, but you have to connect it because it's the same. It's the same bamboozling that Hitler did Against the Jews. Yep. Exactly. Yep. You've got to have an enemy. And an all other. the people, yeah, an other. And uh, we know it's convenient to find these others, and then they zap into them. Now, it should be, well, you know what happened even with Martin Luther King. All right, I'm going to use him for a moment, because when he put together the Poor People's Campaign, remember? What yes. was he pulling together? He was pulling together poor people, regardless. Everyone. That's right. Regardless. regardless. Appalachian Whites. Yep. Poor blacks, yep. Native Americans, Americans, Hispanics, they can't stand that type of force because they know we have the power. They don't really. So They is, have a solution, bamboozled, as Right, and what does that tell us about today? Just think about that <laughs> for a minute. It won't surprise you also to know that um, the Black Panthers look to Karl Marx for a lot of their economic philosophy. They address the economic exploitation as the root of all oppression, particularly uh, capitalism, and they called for the abolition of capitalism. So if they weren't dangerous with all of their other programs, this certainly put them, made them a target. Well, Martin Luther King did the same thing. Yes. You know, capitalism was one of the things that he railed against. Now, I'm not... Uh, 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 we are who we are, and we need to stand up together. We have to realize that because individually, they control all of us. We can't get anywhere. What if all the poor people in Savannah, which is the majority of people, actually poverty uh, level is what, uh, 25% or so? 35. 35% wow. of poverty in the city. Uh, that's a great number of people. And if we ever got together, oh, just unstoppable like force. And that's not counting the middle class, which is also being. Uh, hoodwinked. So before we actually get to who were George and Jonathan Jackson, we're going to stop for a moment and identify the station. You're listening to WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community radio with global soul. 
And now we're going to give you a few words from our sponsor. This portion of WRUU LP Savannah Soundings programming is made possible by a grant from Brighter Day Natural Foods, offering produce, vitamins, and supplements, and a deli and juice bar. Brighter Day is located at 1102 Bull Street at the south end of Forsyth Park. More information available at 912-236-4703 or brighterdayfoods.com. If your business enjoys our programming on WRUULP, please support the station with a donation. Let your customers, neighbors, and friends know that you share our vision of building a thriving community based on diverse, vibrant radio programming. As a business partner, our listeners will know you support Savannah's only broad-based community radio station. Become a tower sponsor or underwriter. To check out the levels of corporate sponsorship and to donate, Go to www.wruu.org slash business. Again, to check out the levels of corporate sponsorship and to donate, go to www.wruu.org slash business. Thank you for listening to and supporting WRUULP. And thank you for staying with us during the um during the words from our sponsor and telling you how as a business and I'll say also as an individual you can support this station you're listening to Barbara Albert and Sada and we're talking about Black August and its beginnings with the Black Panther Party in particular George and Jonathan Jackson yeah uh, the Black Panther Party has always been um, ever since I first realized what it was and when it came into existence has always been something that's been very near and dear to me in many ways. Uh, I like the the programs they laid out. I like what they did. They had a positive approach to things. They understand understood who the real enemy was, which is something we don't today. We are so confused, we don't know anything. And they're keeping us that way, this group of capitalists and, and people, uh, on purpose. Because if we know and we can unite as they did then, we can turn the tide now. Because uh, we are all capable of working together one with each other. So, yeah. The Black Panther Party, uh, we're talking about briefly as because George uh, Jackson was uh, in prison uh, as a Black Panther. And um, his brother, of course, uh, Jonathan. Uh, the story, if you get a chance, please watch Black August. It is well worth watching. Absolutely. And it will raise a lot of questions. So go on the Internet and start Googling these things and start learning the real history because we are fed so much stuff in school about all the important people that were not important in the least. The real people never get mentioned. The people that paid the price, as Sada mentioned earlier, you know, half the people that fight these wars, we're all poor. We don't know what we're doing. They start these things and off we go killing each other. We don't even think. So right. we need to do that. Uh, like the 10-point program for... Uh, yeah, for uh, economic econ development. Econ ex yeah, since we're all economically exploited. <laughs> and uh, the root of all oppression it, uh, is capitalism. So right. one thing they wanted above all things was the abolition of capitalism. So let's let's talk for a little bit about George Jackson. He was a member of the Black Panther Party, and he is also, it's also stated, although we found some contradictory information, that he also started what's called the Black Guerrilla Family, which was a more militant arm of the Black Panther Party. In 1960, George was accused of stealing $70 from a gas station in Los Angeles, and at the advice of his lawyer, was told to plead guilty rather than go to trial based upon some prior convictions. Or um, petty crime, I might petty say. Crime. These were not right. major petty crime. crimes of any, any, any wealth. Right. So he was sentenced, This, I mean, this is an amazing sentence. One year to life was his sentence. And that's a bit shocking, I would think. Um, he spent the next 10 years in Soledad prison, seven and a half of them in solitary confinement. This is for stealing $70. In 1969, he and two other black inmates were accused of murdering a white prison guard, not because there was any substantial evidence, but because they had previously been identified as black militants by the prison authorities. In 
Now, I hate to break in here, but this was also an instance where the guards had murdered three inmates. And it was set up as a, right. as a, to do that. So, And when they went before the boards that, uh, like our police do today, oh, it was justifiable. Everything they did was above yep. board, justifiable. They kept waiting, George and these others, for some semblance. He said he was naive. Some semblance that there might be even an inkling of justice. Right. Well, we know even today, with the recent history in the last five years, it doesn't exist in this country, both from the prisons or the police departments or anything else. It just doesn't. Right. And because of his sentence and um, this new charge, if he was convicted, he w his sentence would have been the death penalty. He and the other two black bit inmates became known as the Soledad brothers. And it became a political cause for change in the prison system and went hand in hand with other rebellions that were going on outside the prisons in more than 100 cities and also the mass movement to end the Vietnam War. So you have to kind of put yourself in the context of the 60s and what was happening to, um, to think about this particular situation and how it was going to be used to um, try to change conditions, try to change the oppressive conditions in prisons like Soledad and then San Quentin. Um, so um, George's younger brother, Jonathan, was at home while George was in prison. And when he heard about the three inmates being charged and the possibility that they could face a death sentence, he got together with some others and they did a raid on a Marin County courthouse. They got guns into the courthouse and they captured some hostages, the, the, judge, the judge and some and other, some other there, yeah. Yeah, witnesses. And it was it, it appeared from the movie that it was kind of a botched plan. People didn't show up who were supposed to. As they were trying to get away, there was a shootout, and Jonathan was killed along with the judge. And this was on August 7th of 1970. And this was, this was one of the two events that led to designating Black August, a time when people stood up to oppression in a variety of ways. Well, I don't even want to say about some of the stuff. The prisons, the conditions now, the conditions then, the people that are in prisons, probably 99% of them shouldn't be. Right. And uh, we certainly use them for a lot of things other than the, uh, I guess, the societal intent from time to time, the rehabilitation. Uh, that has nothing to do with prisons, probably really never did. Uh, so I, I don't know what to say. I would like to see the abolition of prison system. I would like to see uh, society come up with better solutions for how we solve these problems because uh, even the amount of political prisoners that are in prison right now, I mean, you go through the list. We, we have so many political prisons in this country. We have more prisoners than the rest of the industrialized nations combined. Yep, and even when you think about George Jackson, was he really in prison from one year to life because of stealing $70 no. or because of his mil militancy? I mean, he was clearly a political a prisoner man as well. man kills someone, he gets seven years, he's out in five. He right. steals $70 and he he's, in, he's got a life sentence. <laughs> There's a lot more there yes. than just a commission of a crime. Of course, Sada, you've never heard of anything like that, right? Oh, right. <laughs> right, right. Oh, right. You never, of course you've never heard of anything like that. Yeah. Asante, Asante Shakur. Yes. Yes. Who would probably have died or been murdered in prison had she not escaped to Cuba. That's right. Her salvation was Cuba. Her salvation because these people accused her of shooting at them when all the evidence shows the way she was shot up by the police <laughs> that she could not have lifted a weapon wow. to shoot them. Mm -hmm. And 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 they're doing it again. And they're doing with it again. Imam Jamil Alamine, formerly known as H. Rap Brown, has been incarcerated for the last eighteen years. And as always, it's always amazing to me. They've always 
ma- they always manage to shoot and kill police officers. <laughs> yeah, isn't well, that amazing? The, the story never, change, never changes. changes. We have Leonard Peltier of the uh, American Indian Movement. Yes, Forty something. Same years. story. Yes. Same know. story. Absolutely, it's it's amazing to me that we aren't up in arms about this. You know, the the t- uh, terrific amount. Angela Davis said she had had to escape to Angola, right. exactly, you know, right. and along with some of the other Black Panthers, yes, just for trying to protect themselves, feed themselves, and do what everyone has a right to do. That's right. And George Jackson, I mean, he understood. And instead of succumbing to the dehumanization of the political, of the prison experience, he wrote these incredibly eloquent letters um, in a revolutionary voice and described the prison conditions, his feelings about being disenfranchised, his feelings about the disenfranchisement of so many sectors of the population, the poor, the victimized, the imprisoned, the disillusioned. These letters are totally amazing, and they have been captured in a book called Soledad Brothers. One of the things I want to say, because I have a tendency to forget things if I don't say yes, it right when I'm thinking say it, it, is that... We're, in those days, George was living in a time of revolutionary thought, revolutionary ideals and ideas. We're living in a time of reformism. <laughs> we want to reform the prison system. Yes, we want to reform. Yes. We want a more just system. Capitalism can't provide that under any circumstances. It just is not geared for that. It is geared for the wealthy, the rich, and the powerful, and the poor are the stepping stones. So we need to really start... Moving back towards that revolutionary concepts, the revolutionary ideals, we do need to start reading more of of these revolutionary leaders from the 60s and the 70s, as well as the Marx and the different uh, things that influenced them, Che Guevara. In fact, we ran across one, and I know I'm t- about to go ahead. here, but I, we ran across one that I'm really enthralled with that I want to know more about. His name is Williams. Fred, um, Robert. Robert F. Williams. Yes. You, have you ever heard of Robert F. Williams? No. Okay, Robert okay. F. Williams, I'm going to tell you, is called the Che Guevara of America. Uh, black leader. Uh, he had to flee to, to Cuba where he broadcast called Radio... Free uh, Dixie. Radio Free Dixie. That was it. But... Uh, I'd, I'd like to see more of that, not yeah, not fleeing to Cuba necessarily, but I'd like to see more of the militancy and the understanding of what we're up against because we are so, you mentioned it, we, the t- We've been hoodwinked and bamboo, so I always try to yeah. tell folk they need to read several books. Seize the Time by Bobby Seale, yeah. Soul on Ice by Eldridge yeah. Cleaver. Yeah. I also tell black folk, if you truly want to be revolutionary, you need to read the book, The Spook Who Sat by the Door. Okay. Yeah, that's Which, one I haven't heard of. Well, so I explain haven't heard just of that either. For a second of it. Uh, the Spook Who Sat by the Door is about a black man who becomes a CIA agent. <laughs> but that's not re- he's really not a CIA agent. What he is doing is taking everything that the CIA has taught him trained and trained him to do and taking it into the black community and training the young brothers there in these tactics. So he sits by day he plays this Uncle Tom, and by night he's training them, even though he knows he will probably be the first once they figure out what he's doing to lose his life, which he is in the book, but it's too late because these young brothers have been trained. Wow. So he is our man on the inside. So he is on yeah, the, cool. on the inside. Like that. That's great. So, um, yeah, while we're being trained to, you know, nod, ignore, obey, be obedient, get through what you need to get through, there were people like George Jackson who said, no, you I'm not... believe all the bull that we are told. what you're told. That's right. So while in prison, George could not do that. It was his political consciousness that kept him incarcerated for years. In his own words from the movie Black August, he acknowledges that if he had played the game, he would have been released with only one year. He never would have languished for as long as he did. And when he was accused of murdering the prison guard, he stated that he had already served one year for every $10 that he had stolen. Plus, he said he was never going to be broken. He was going to be a man That's until right. the day he died. That's right. And they could not break him. 
I wonder if we had that spirit now, uh, what would happen? What we could do. On the outside and the inside. Well, personally, I have always felt that there has been a a systematic, as Van Jones, the, the journalist, has yeah. said, yep. it, as he says in the movie 13, you came in, you executed all of the leaders in the black neighborhood, you filled them with drugs, mm-hmm. and you left us fairly rudderless. On right. top of which, you set up a scenario for us to go underneath. And that scenario was you set up welfare. But what you did when you initially set up welfare was you could not have a man in the home. <laughs> That's right. So I you remember took that. men out of the home, and the state became the daddy, oh, and the yeah. state is a horrendous daddy. That's right. What better way to control yes. people? And just, exactly. Yeah, totally emasculate destroy families. Everything. Emasculate. That and I'm not talking about emasculating in terms of male. I mean just in general no. power. A, a, a right. power, power, power and away. a people. Right. And, and, right. and you have done it to such a degree that we st- we have black women now who say, I don't need a man. Well, excuse me, that's not the design. Yes, you d- it, it, you you do. You, you, you have bought this. But the but the state is now playing that role. You just yeah. don't recognize it. Yeah, the state is doing that role. I, I, I'm I'm going to read something here. Good. If you don't mind. I I'm, would I'm like you to read, read it. I was just pointing to it. This is something that really. This is uh, amazing. This is in. This is from George Jackson himself. He says, "International capitalism cannot be destroyed without the extremes of struggle." The entire colonial world is watching the blacks inside the U.S., wondering and waiting for us to come to our senses. Their problems and struggles with the American monster are much more difficult than they would be if we actively aided them. We are on the inside. We are the only ones, beside the very small white minority left, who can get at the monster's heart without subjecting the world to nuclear fire. We have a momentous historical role to act out if we will. The whole world for all time in the future will love us and remember us as the righteous people who made it possible for the world to live on. If we fail, though, through fear and lack of aggressive imagination, then the slaves of the future will curse us as we sometimes curse those of yesterday. I don't want to die and leave a few sad songs and to hump in the ground as my only monument. I want to leave a world that is liberated from trash, pollution, racism, nation-states, nation-state wars and armies, from pomp, bigotry, uh, parochialism, a thousand different brands of untruth, and licentious, usurious economics. And That's in, powerful words. Those are powerful words, and in fact, George Jackson lived those words. He met with his lawyer on August 21st, who pretty much said to him, you know, this trial does not look good. They're only going to allow admission of evidence from the prison guards. They're pointing their finger at you. They're not looking at anything else. And he knew he saw the writing on the wall. So as he was being escorted back to his cell, he had somehow gotten a hold of a, pris- a pistol. He... Um, got it out, he um, put locked people in a cell, got out into the yard with another inmate, they got almost as far as the gate and they were shot dead. And this is a statement to the fact that George Jackson would not, would not just be another hump in the soil. He was going to be somebody who took a stand, who gave his life for a cause, and he surely did that. So based upon these two stories of George and Jonathan Jackson, people decided to designate this Black August. Both of these young men died in August, and they died standing up and struggling for a cause. Uh, One thing that's important here is Ho Chi Minh made a statement, and if I get this right because I can't remember it (laughs) off the top of my head, was that open the prison doors and the dragon comes out. So when uh, George Jackson pulled the gun, he said, gentlemen, the dragon has come. And that uh, connection was amazing to me, you know, referencing that type of logic. Most of us don't, couldn't even tell you today. You ask 20 people down the street who was Ho Chi Minh, I doubt anyone could even tell you anymore. I bet they couldn't. You're right. No, they could not. No, they could not. And the other thing George said, which is bre- very prophetic, 
I'm in a unique pol political position. I have a very I have a very nearly closed future, and since I have always been inclined to get disturbed over organized injustice or terrorist practice against the innocents, wherever, I can now say just about what I want. I've always done just about that without fear of self exposure. I can only be executed once. Now, we all know from the history, uh, those of us who know anything about history at all, that George and Jonathan Jackson were not the only black people in history who refused to be enslaved or who refused to be unjustly imprisoned or to have lost their lives in a struggle and who could have been written out of the history books. Well, they have been. Well, they have been. They have been written out of been. history uh, books. They history. were radicals, and right. they were not just reformists, as I said no. earlier. They were radicals. No. They wanted a future, and they were willing to fight for it and do whatever was necessary. Here we're saying, please, Mr. Mann, would you please reform this a bit so life is just a little bit better for us? And, right. it, a, and the it is constant. Um, Nat Turner, the the new movie Birth of a Nation, yes. Yes. which was about, which is is about the Nat Turner Rebellion. Everyone thought this movie was on target for an Oscar. So what do they do? <laughs> they discredit the writer and the director of it because if you show this, you do not want to glorify Nat Turner. Which, by the way, this weekend in Virginia, they will be doing. Uh, um, they will be commemorating the rebellion of Nat, Nat Turner, Turner in Virginia. Wow. Um, but they had to discredit it because if people watch this, if black people in particular mm -hmm. watch this and see that there were slaves who absolutely refused. That's right. Right. Who refused and who thought that their only alternative to this refusal was to overthrow the, the system. That's, That's right. The That's system right. of slavery. They, they, he absolutely believed that. And maybe we need to take back some of this revolutionary spirit because we have gone to sleep. Yes, we have. You, and you know, the, uh, as I said, Robert, uh, maybe, yeah, Robert, uh, Williams Robert Williams was uh, called the Che Guevara, you know, a, a, because they were revolutionaries trying to liberate South America. You had the, uh, uh, the, the, the liberation movements all over Africa. You had the liber and they all had to be put down. I remember recently there was a movie about Palestine. It was called Five Broken Cameras. It was a great yeah. movie. It was on tap to win uh, the Oscars. Uh, the, for the best picture, it lost also because of uh, this relationship we have with right. Israel. So Palestine right. was not a good topic at that point in time, so they lost. Uh, it, it was an important movie. Yes, anyway. very important movie. And Robert, Willi Robert F. Williams is a very important um, person in the history, in, in, in black history and all of our histories. And I urge you to Google him. Find out what you can. It's amazingly important. Um, a couple of other people, Ella, <laughs> Ella Baker, a brilliant black hero of the freedom movement who inspired and guided emerging leaders who battled Jim Crow, believed that people cannot be free until there's enough work in this land to give everybody a job, and helped Martin Luther King start the SCLC in 1957. And we just talked about Fannie Lou Hamer a bit when I saw the speech she gave. Uh, she was part of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party that tried to go to the 64 Democratic National Convention to take the seats because they earned those seats. It was yes. their seats, uh, but they were refused. That uh, it was. It's an interesting listen to her speech and what she says, and also the the collusion with the Democrats to keep them out. They couldn't let that happen. It, it, this was a white convention. Uh, she was also the first woman to ever serve as official Miss Mississippi delegate to the national convention. Even so, they did not allow her to speak. And they said, "Well, we will admit two of your delegates, but they have to sit up in the peanut gallery. They can't right. vote." 
Right. And now these are the Democrats. Remember, yes, the these are the Democrats. People. Or the Dixiecrats. The yeah, Dixiecrats. The Dixiecrats. But not all of them were Dixiecrats. No, this was Northern. Even these were, these were Northerners. These were Hubert Westerners. Humphrey. This was, was the, that's that. right, this was the Democratic Party. Um, she also spoke out vehemently against the Vietnam War. That's and a crime right there. She, yeah, she is um, credited with a quote, a very famous quote. She said, I am sick and tired of being sick, sick and, tired. and tired. A quote heard round the world. There were more names and a lot more events. So many of them are so important. Names like uh, Mamiya Abu Jamar. Asada That's Shakur. One that we all yes. know, Mamiya. Uh, Bobby Seale. H. Rep. Brown. Eldridge Cleaver. Fred Hampton. Henrietta Locks. Nat Turner. John Brown. Gabriel Prosser. Denmark Vesey. Emmett Till. George, uh, the Reverend George Lee. Andrew Goodman. James Cheney. Michael Schwerner. Medgar Evers. Viola Liozzo. Lamar Smith. John Earl Reese. William Edwards Jr. Mark Charles Parker. Herbert Lee. Corporal Roman Duxworth. Paul Giard. William Lewis Moore. Four Birmingham children, which we all remember forever. Addie Mae Collins, Denise McNair, Carol Robertson, and Cynthia Wesley. Virgil Lamar Ware. Lewis Allen. Reverend Johnny May Chapel, Reverend Bruce Klunger. Henry Hezekiah D. Charles Eddie Moore. Lieutenant Colonel Lemuel Penn. Jimmy Lee Jackson. Reverend James Reeb. O'Neill Moore. Willie Brewster. Jonathan Myrick Daniels. Samuel Lehman Young. And Vernon, Vernon, uh, Vernon Ferdinand Dahmer. Ben Chester White. Clarence Triggs. Warless Jackson. Benjamin Brown. Samuel Ephesius Hammond, Jr. Uh, Delano Herman Middleton, Henry Ezekiel Smith. There were a lot of events that we don't that we should be remembering now. That are, uh, right after the uh, death of uh, of uh, George Jackson, of course, not too long afterwards was the Attica uprising in in New York, the Stoner Rebellion in 1839. These are rebellions, people seeking their freedom that far back. Right, the New York City Conspiracy of 1741. Gabriel's Conspiracy in 1800. German Coast Uprising in 1811. The Weeping Time here in Savannah, which wasn't an uprising, but certainly something that we all need to know about. The Memphis Sanitation Workers' Strike in 1968. And even here in Savannah, I remember it and I have looked and can't find anything about it at all. The Durst Bakery Strike in 1971. I remember going down to uh, the church, and I've forgotten the name of the church now, where it was, on MLK. So one of the things that we are definitely thinking about doing is put, bringing together a reading group, a reading club, and um, trying to recapture these people, trying to bring them to the forefront, to rekindle that revolutionary spirit that we so absolutely need today, particularly in light of the events this past weekend. Yeah, we... Um thought long and hard about this, but we certainly feel that we need to make a statement about the events that occurred this past weekend in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, it's an extremely saddened time by the death and injuries that resulted. We're even more saddened by what we see happening in the United States overall, all across this country. Over the past several weeks, we've discussed the power and role of the corporate media and the deep state, and if you listen to this show, you know the depth of, of these people and how they will do anything to stay in power and not let the people have uh, what is rightfully ours. And uh, so we've asked uh, this question, I think, and we've come to the conclusion because we need to ask this question, is this violence a result of two opposing groups sharing the same space at the same time, or was it orchestrated allowed to happen to accomplish a more sinister goal by a more ominous group. Who benefits from all this? Where do we go from here? The people certainly don't benefit. We've got these rallies now popping up all over the country. Gainesville, Florida next week. Uh, with the move to to uh, move remove all these symbols and things, I'm just wondering what we need to do. So we need to stop we need to think strategically. We need to calculate. We need to do what this month was designed to do, 
to create solutions and not to just run on sheer emotion. Absolutely. That's what we have to say about it. So, Sada, thank you so much for being part of this discussion. We hope that we um, gave you information, things you didn't know, things you're going to get to know more about. Please stay in touch with our Facebook page because we will be planning some events, some reading groups to further this conversation. And also, please stay tuned for Evening Eclectic with Dave Lake. Thank you for tuning in to WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community, community radio with Global Soul.